Episode 4, Tom Zupancic, Vice President of DEEM. Welcome to Gut Plus Science. Analytics about people. Insights for executives. Truth you can act on. A high-energy, fast-paced, results-oriented exchange featuring employee engagement evangelist and CEO, your host, Nikki Llewellyn. You're in for a real treat with our guest today. I want to talk to you about a problem that I think he's going to help us solve. So did you know that more money is spent on leadership development than any other area of corporate training? Yet 71% of companies do not feel that their leaders are able to lead them into the future or take their company to the next level. So we're spending a lot of time and money on the emphasis of developing our leaders, but we don't feel that the strategies and tactics that we're using are going to get us where we need to go. Well, the guy I have in this show today has spent 28 years on the sidelines of the NFL coaching the world's greatest football players and is now working and leading thousands of employees in one of the largest electrical mechanical companies in the nation. This man has done some amazing things, and I'm honored to say that I've got to work alongside him for a couple of projects. I consider him definitely a mentor. And when we spent time doing the interview, we have this bonus segment of uh, the learning of how Tom Zupanzik did a multi-million dollar 20-year deal with Lucas Oil to bring to us Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis. It is such a cool story, and I'd love to share it with you, but we're not going to be able to cover it in today's segment. It's a bonus round. So you can hit me up on LinkedIn, find me Nikki, it's N-I-K-K-I, last name is L-E-W-A-L-L-E-N, hit me up on LinkedIn, or you can email me and we can send that over to you. You don't want to miss it. It's a super cool story. I was pumped up after we uh, had the chance to just really inspired. Honestly, I was like, I could go do bigger things. This guy is like inspiring. We're going to dive right in. Before we do that, I want to hear quickly from our sponsor, and then I'm going to ask Tom the very first question to do a deep dive and start learning from him. So let's hear from our sponsor. LHD is a full-service employee benefits firm that empowers their clients to make the best possible decisions for their employees, to define optimal objectives, monitor outcomes, improve health, and engage and advocate for employees and their loved ones. Visit LHDbenefits.com. All right, Tom, welcome to the show. When it comes to your core theme as a leader, what is the one thing that takes precedence in your people strategy? Well, I think it's it's probably multifaceted. One, I think it, it, there's a, a myth out there that you have to treat everybody the same. And I, I really don't believe that that's true. I think you have to, you have to kind of you have to be malleable to that person's personality. So what motivates one person is not going to definitely motivate another person. Some people need a kick in the rear end. Some people need a pat on the back uh, and, and everything in between. So as close as you can get to what really pushes that person's button, what really makes them come to work every day? Do they want to buy a bigger house? Do they want to send their kids to school? Do they want to buy a a different car? Whatever it is that motivates them, you go down that track with them. And then I think you end up getting the most out of them. And and, uh, really, our goal at Dean is to uh, make everybody the best that they can be. So we offer a lot of training. We offer a lot of classes where they can better themselves. And as they bring more value to the organization, then they get paid more money and there is no cap. So, uh, you know, there it's, it's a matter of bringing value every day. Obviously customer services is, is supposed to be the number one thing, but in our world at where, you know, we have, uh, you know, 1200 people that are out there working on things that can kill you. I mean, it literally kill you, these, you know, these big units that they work on and in these environments that they work in. Our biggest thing is safety. We want, if a guy's a good guy when he leaves home in the morning, we want to send him home a good guy when the evening's over. And the vice versa. If he's not a good guy in the morning, we'll take him and we'll send him home. Not a good guy at the end of the day. But we want to, our people to be safe. Second, or I guess 1A is We've got to please our customer. We've got to do whatever it is that it takes. And there is no no here. That's another thing that uh, I think is different in, in, in our particular culture. There is no no. 
we will figure out a way to do it. If we're meeting with a customer in Denver, Colorado, and they say, can you support Denver, Colorado? Do you have an office here? The answer is yes. And then tomorrow we will because we follow our customers across the country and there is no no. There is no what we seldom, if ever, I've never heard our owners say, we can't do this. We always do what we say we're going to do. And we have the cavalry behind us to put on a job if we're having problems so that we can please love the customer. It. Absolutely love it. And Tom, as you're speaking, I'm taking down some key takeaways for our audience. And I'm going to summarize them at the end. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to have to save 10 minutes for that part. I'm already, already making quite the page here. So, okay, Tom, I want to hear this. What has been your greatest failure turned lesson with regards to people and culture? Probably learned it first in coaching. And, and again, I'll go back to the first statement I made. Everybody can't be treated the same. If you try to lump everybody together, you're going to fail. Uh, you have to treat people to their strengths. And uh, Tony Dungy really taught a good lesson in that uh, everybody in the locker room loved Tony Dungy. They would run through a wall for him, and they won a Super Bowl for him because of the way that he treated people. And he didn't treat everybody the same, but he treated everybody fairly. And what he did, and it was a great lesson for me, is he always looked for somebody doing something good. So he didn't look for you doing something bad so he could correct you. He looked for the good things in people so he could compliment you. And then your strengths became so strong that your weaknesses didn't matter. So it was looking for people doing something good and then recognizing those people in front of their peers. And we, we continue that uh, even in the electrical mechanical business here, our dispatchers, our account coordinators, our salespeople, anytime there's a compliment from the customer, we put it up on our website. We make sure that we all acknowledge the uh, technician that got the compliment and uh, we give them that pat on the back that uh, everybody appreciates. A paycheck, everybody in America just about makes a paycheck. But not everybody in America can go, can go home and say, look on this website to their kids, to their wife, and see on that website that they've been acknowledged as doing a good job. So there's far more to it, reward to having a job and, and having a career than just the paycheck. I think, uh, and I think with the millennials, it's more almost as important that they get recognition and that they are allowed to thrive in an organization that recognizes their positive qualities. You just talked about how just about everybody in America right now is getting a paycheck, like unemployment is at, is at one of the all-time lows right now. So it'll it's a good segue into a question I wanted to ask you about, what is your greatest challenge when it comes to engaging your people, knowing that the talent war is so strong, and especially in the world of specialty that you have to recruit in your organization and being probably tough to keep up with the volume of people that are trained, you know, to be able to come into this organization. Speak to me about that a little bit. When you're talking about our technicians, our specialists, uh, you know, there are very few kids looking out of their classroom on a roof next door when it's five degrees below zero and they see a guy up there working on a uh, heating and air conditioning unit, and they're thinking to themselves, yeah, that's me. That's what I want to do. They're not thinking that way. You know, that that's hard. It's hard work. It's tough work. And it requires a, a very special set of skills to be able to do it. And then you're putting your body through miserable situations all the time. They're working in extreme cold, they're working in extreme heat, and they're lifting heavy things. They're putting themselves in confined spaces. Uh, it is an, a real challenge. And I think in the next 10 years, it's going to be really tough because high schools, I believe, you know, are judged on how many people they can send to college. And I know, you know, where my kids went to high school, they went to cathedral. That was a big deal. How many kids are going to go to college? You'd have 100% of the kids go to college. But 100% of the kids aren't, college isn't, isn't made for everybody. 
if you go into the trades, you can become an engineer, you can go into the trades. Or, you know, there are a lot of ways that you can go into the trades. You come out, if somebody comes here to us as a 20 year old and they say that they want to go into the heating and air conditioning business or they want to go into the refrigeration side of our company or to the contract side where we build buildings. We'll take them, we'll train them, we'll send them to school. We pay, it's their time, our dime. And uh, we'll pay them to go to school. So when they get, when they when they finally do get their, you know, they graduate from the, the uh, ABC school that we send them to, they'll have zero debt and they will have made money the entire time that they've trained. So there are a lot of benefits to, uh, to getting into the trades now, at the end of the day, they're difficult, and it's uh, you know, and it constantly changes with technology. So it's it's a college education every day they come to work because they never know what the next the new software that's going to come out that's going to be a control system that operates you know every every building at the Indianapolis 500, and uh, they've got to be able to know that, plug into it, and be able to operate those systems. There's so many people out there that are struggling with the lack of talent, especially in certain niche markets and the way that, you know, these new generations are coming in and how to, how in the heck do we get these people in the door? And you just, you have to be super innovative nowadays. And I think what Dean is doing is just neat to hear is just truly investing in that person from the day that they say, I do, I, I'm in and investing in them as much as you would a five-year employee and putting that trust in them, thinking that the outcome is just going to be like, like what happened with your deal with Lucas, you know, is like, I, I'm going to believe in this a hundred percent from the beginning and we're going to make it happen. And so it's neat to neat to hear. I think that's very inspirational for a lot of people that are our listeners. So change of pace. Well, oh, well yeah, let me, sure. let me, let me add one more thing to that too. In our company, we don't have non-competes. So Anytime you don't want to work at Deem, you can leave and go get a job three blocks away at another at another company. Our owner uh, is his mindset is if you don't want to be here, we certainly don't want to hold you here, and we also don't want to stop you from making a living. So we don't do the non competes. So when people come in, when we get young people in here, we send them to school. We tell them at the end of the day that we're and during that entire process, we're creating loyalty. And loyalty goes a long way. Loyalty is what makes that person go that extra mile. And a, a real sign of that is we're not having them sign any paperwork that says, after we're done with this, you have to stay with us. We want them to want to stay with us. And that creates a culture that you want to work with them. I'm so glad you added that in. That's powerful stuff. Question for you, Tom, when it comes to books that have changed your life, quotes that you live by, a movie that just inspired you beyond belief, any of that stuff, like what's co- what's some of your personal favorites? Well, you, you said I grew up in on the west side of Indianapolis in Hallville. So uh, Hallville is not a place you go on vacation. It's, uh, you know, it's it was a, I grew up in a in a Yugoslavian family, very ethnic family. Uh, my dad, my dad was one of the guys like on Saturday Night Live. He'd say, how many jobs you have? You only have one job? That's too, that's not enough. He had five jobs. Wow. You know what I mean, he went to work in the morning as a welder. Then he went and he taught welding at Tech High School at night. He had a band. He had a roofing company. I mean, he worked all the time. And he did that, you know, and uh, at a time, when it, you know, I had, I had three other siblings. And, uh, you know, we lived in a house that when they sold their house, I remember exactly, they sold it for $12,000. And that was like a ton of money. I don't know how, and I drive by it now. And, I, you know, I'm close to 300 pounds. I don't know how I could live in it by myself. You know, I think uh, things that, that, that motivated me along the way, you know, I was, I was always involved in athletics and I was mostly involved in uh, in wrestling, and wrestling is an individual sport, so there's nobody to blame. It's you. If you lose, you lose. If you win, you win. Nobody got you there. You got yourself there, and you had to deal with those emotions. And and you know when you're uh, doing it at a high level, and uh, when I was competing for the Olympics and ended up being an alternate, that was a loss. And I remember coming home from the Olympic trials in 1984, and I didn't 
I didn't speak for three weeks. So, you know, because I had put so much into it. Uh, but, you know, then I rebounded, went and applied at the Colts and uh, kind of a, in, in, in keeping with that same thought process, I sent my resume to Frank Cush, the then first coach of the Colts here in Indianapolis, and uh, sent it with a, uh, a delivery service and they he turned it away. He said, I'm not hiring anybody. So I sent it again the next day with the delivery service and the secretary said that we're not hiring and she didn't take it. And so on the 10th time that I sent it to him, uh, uh, which was 10 days in a row, the delivery guy thought I was crazy paying this money to have it delivered every day. He came out of his office, kind of ripped it out of the guy's hands, took it inside. And, you know, the guy had done our delivery guy had done his job. And uh, later on that evening, he called me on the phone. He said, I just read your resume. He said, can you come in tomorrow and uh, do an interview? And I went in the next day, did an interview with him and a couple of the other coaches. And that was my first foot in the door of the NFL. He said, you're going to be, and my wife was so excited because she thought, boy, you're going to be making, you know, you're going to be making Peyton Manning money. Boy, it's going to be great. We're going to be, you know, we're going to be set for life. And I remember exactly what he told me. He said, you're going to be working about 70 hours a week. He said, I'm going to pay you $200 a week. And that amounted to $157.40 that I was going to be taken home. I went home and told my wife everything but that. She was so excited. (laughs) Then she finally asked, how much are you going to get it paid? And I said, honey, I just got my foot in the door. And this is just a little stipend. So the next year, Frank left, a new coach came in, and then I got hired to my first real NFL contract. So uh, what motivates me are our challenges. What motivates me are, are seeing our, our workers, our people that work inside the building, in the office, that support the field, uh, at working in unison together, have a great teamwork. Our work area is very... Google-esque, I guess you could call it, where in close quarters, it's like uh, working on a stock room floor. There's information flying back and forth all the time so that we can make sure that we get the best guy that we have in the field to the situation that he needs to take care of for our customer. So communication, free communication and being able to speak your mind and, and bring me any problems. I I might as well not have a door because we have people coming in and out of my door so often. That's what keeps me going. That's what motivates me. That's what uh, makes me get up in the morning and come to work. I, I speak to every orientation class that we have come through and we'll hire between four and 20 people a week. Uh, and, and I wear, you know what fun socks are, right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I always ask them, I said, what are your fun socks? And they have no idea what I'm talking about. I said, what makes you get up in the morning? Why do you come? Why do you get up? Why do you come to work? Why do you look in the mirror and get a checkup from the neck up and make sure you don't have hardening of the attitudes? And I say, I said, every time I have a bad day, I look at my fun socks and I pull my pant leg up and I've got fun socks on some kind of a, whether they have you know, beers on them or bears on them or, you know, parakeets, but there's some kind of fun socks. I said, that reminds me that I've got it good. That reminds me of why I come to work every day. And no matter how bad the day is, if you think about what drives you, it helps you get through that day because everybody's going to have a bad day from time to time. Oh, that's so good. It's so good. And I told you when we were starting this podcast today, I was like, I know that we could sit here all day. I literally could sit with you all day. I'm just glowing on the other side of this microphone. So this has just been so fun, Tom. I got to learn new things about you. And we've had some other conversations where I've, I've heard some pretty cool stories. Custom Concrete has been creating foundations for the finest homes, commercial buildings, and industrial facilities throughout central Indiana since 1969. Builders, contractors, and homeowners rely on our expertise because so much depends on getting it right. Our knowledge and control of all aspects of the job, from excavation to waterproofing to backfill, means that extra value is built into every project. Codes don't drive our business. Excellence does. See the difference at customconcrete.com.
All right, now let's get to the truth you can act on section. This is the key takeaways from today's action-packed show. Um, I couldn't write fast enough, so I probably didn't capture everything, but here we go. So number one, know your people's motivation. We can't treat all employees the same. We can't think that one employee's motivation is another person's motivation. And so it's really important to spend time listening and truly understanding the people on your team and what motivates them and really helping them be able to tap into that. If you've ever heard of or read the book, The Dream Manager, um, whichever, maybe you never heard of it, I highly recommend it. It's by Matthew Kelly. It is a wonderful book, probably 10 years old, changed my life and really got me on, on the path for which I'm in now as far as my career. But it speaks a lot to this about understanding what makes each individual tick and helping them find their dreams and then tie their role at the company you know, into that dream very clearly. So that's that. And the next is um, customer service is a super top priority, but it doesn't take priority over number one, which is your employees. And so um, it's so important if you know that uh, saying about, you know, oh, when you're on an airplane and the flight attendants say you need to put on your oxygen mask before you can put on anybody else's or take care of anybody else. Same thing applies here. We have to take care of our people first. And Tom spoke a lot today about the importance of safety and just they, they take that so seriously, especially with the type of work that they're doing at Deem. Number three, always look for the good in things and people and recognize what they're doing well first. Even when you have to approach somebody and, you know, have a tough conversation, always start by building on the positives. I wonder if Tom and his collaboration with Tony Dungy was a big piece of this next one, next takeaway that I had which is creating loyalty is what makes our people want to walk through fire for us. And so, gosh, um, I know they both worked on the field for many years together, coaching for the Indianapolis Colts. And that is just the epitome of both of them. They are those guys that I can just see people just walking the fine line or walking through flames for because of the strength and the loyalty of the relationship. And finally, don't forget the power of determination and the importance of having passion for the things you're working on. And just like the story about Tom and just his persistence, he just had a burning desire to do that. And even when people said, we don't even know who Lucas Oil is, that he didn't stop him. And he even put together the dog and pony show and everything. It was just an incredible story of determination. And I just absolutely loved hearing that story again. So with that, guys, I hope you can take some of this information back and do something with it this week. Uh, I do want to end our show on something that Tom shared. You know, there's a poem that I like uh, that I think is uh, is very applicable to to being successful in anything. And I think it's, it's about being true to yourself. It, go, it goes like this. I'll shoot it at you here real quick. Uh, when you get what you want and your struggle for self and the world makes you king for a day, Go to the mirror, take a look at yourself and see what that guy has to say. Because it isn't your mom or your dad or your friend whose judgment upon you must pass. But sooner or later, the person that counts, it's the one looking back in the class. You might be Jack Horner and chisel a plum and say, hey, I'm a wonderful guy. But the man in the glass says you're only a bum if you can't look him straight in the eye. You might fool the world down the pathway years and get pats on the back as you pass. But your final reward is heartache and tears if you've cheated the man in the glass. So don't cheat yourself and have a good day. We just left the world a little bit better. Now go do something with it.